Yay! <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. I'll um, start talking if I can. Mm. All right. Welcome everyone to the 2021 New Orleans Poetry Festival. Many of you have been to a number of these and some of you are attending your first one. So that's pretty cool. I'm Jonathan Pinton. I'm part of the New Orleans Poetry Festival board and I'm also one of the presenters this evening. Um, and this year we just want to really thank our major sponsors, the, Jazz and, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation and the Academy of American Poets. Um, this, all the events this month have been free and open to all, um, and we couldn't have possibly done that without our sponsors. So we're really excited by that. Um, all right, so we are going to hear from myself, um, Paul Hetherington and Cassandra Atherton today. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, why don't we go ahead and introduce ourselves. Um, my name is, like I say, my name is Jonathan. I, in 1998, I founded Unlikely Stories, um, which is a web journal of literature and art. Um, it's been running more or less continuously since then. And in 2005, uh, we started doing full length books, um, Unlikely Books. We do about three or four, three to five poetry books a year. It's all at unlikelystories.org. Um, Cassandra, you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Cassandra Atherton. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Um, I've done quite a lot of work in ekphrasis um, relating to pre-Raphaelite paintings. I'm a bit obsessed with um, Millet and Rossetti and I liked um, in my last book to use their paintings as inspiration to comment on, I guess, the contemporary women's experience. And so, yeah, I have an enduring love of prose poetry, which I think connects in really interesting ways to ekphrastic poetry. Paul, you're next. Yeah, hi. I'm in Canberra, Australia, the capital city of, of this wonderful country. And uh, I've been a, a poet for a long time and I've uh, done a lot of ekphrastic writing. It's, I've, I've had a very long time had an interest in the visual arts and its connection to writing and to poetry in particular. And I was able uh, in 2015 and to 16 to spend six months in Rome where I worked on an ekphrastic project for those six months uh, called um, related called Roman paintings. And I went to a lot of galleries there and I ended up producing a book called Gallery of Antique Art. And I might just say something about that as we go. All right, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Cassandra. So let's go ahead and fire up our PowerPoint because we made a PowerPoint. So that's pretty exciting. So hopefully here we have um, some experienced poets and some newcomers to Ekphrasis. Um, that's, you know, that's the goal here. And hopefully we'll get a variety of voices in that way. Um, basically what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what a crisis is, um, show you some contemporary examples of it, um, some tips and, tips and tricks for writing it. We're gonna give you some prompts. We're all going to write an acrostic poem. Uh, hopefully we'll have time for everyone to share their acrostic poem with a group. And we'll talk, uh, and at that point, if there's still time, we'll talk about notional acrostic and we'll definitely talk about places to submit your acrostic writing. So, so this slide's me, yeah. So um, we were laughing before about ekphrasis, ekphrasis, tomato, tomato. It doesn't really matter how you say it. I think it can be a little bit intimidating as a word. I know a lot of my students, for instance, uh, troop up on it, don't want to say it, uh, feel that it might be a bit elitist, or maybe it's just too kind of Greek for them somehow. But I'm very attached to the fact that we haven't come up with um, a new word in a way. I'm glad we still talk about ekphrasis and ekphrastic writing. And in its kind of most simple definition, um, we would say ekphrasis is writing about an artwork. And I think the most interesting thing and the most contentious thing is actually not ekphrasis, it's what artwork refers to. Um, and so traditionally, people looked at ekphrastic poetry and writing as largely being about paintings, some of the most famous paintings hanging in galleries and, and also sculpture. And we moved a little bit to embracing um, portraits and photographs as well. But I like to think that in the last couple of decades, we've started to explore artwork in, in multifarious ways that are much more interesting. And we're looking now at things like digital exhibitions, ballets, films, um, anything that can be thought of in under that broad umbrella of, of sort of artwork. 
So I think it's become even more interesting in the pandemic because we've had um, a lot of exhibitions go live. We've been, I mean, in Melbourne, I was in lockdown for 111 days. So we weren't allowed to really leave our houses for 111 days, except to get some groceries for half an hour. And a lot of people turned to ways to deal with this kind of sensory deprivation. And so we had a lot of free things online and a lot of ekphrastic writing sort of proliferating from these things. Um, that we had access to all of a sudden all around the world in places that I've never been, which was exciting for me. Um, but just framing it really basically, ekphrasis has been traced back to the Middle Ages with kind of ekphrastic accounts of devotional objects. You can find lots of passages in medieval writing that would be considered ekphrastic and that people have studied and most commonly back to ancient Greece and the vivid descriptions of battles. I mean, that's just a tiny taste of, of sort of where it, it comes down from, I suppose. Um, and the current Renaissance, as I said, is focused on a wide variety of um, artworks in lots of electrifying ways and in hybrid, interesting hybrid ways as well. And I guess the thing that I wanted to say mostly on this slide is the bit in red at the bottom, which is a lot of people think sometimes it's just a description of an artwork, but I always say to my students, no, it's not a description. I'd rather go and see the ballet or watch the film or see the sculpture rather than just reading you describe it. It's about what you bring to it. It's, it's giving that something extra. And it was actually Paul Hetherington, I think who came up with one thing that works really well when I'm teaching at Crassus, which is if an artwork could speak to you, what would it say? And I kind of like that idea. It encourages people to move beyond just looking at describing what's there to thinking about that third layer somehow that's beneath it that you're connecting with. So I think we're on the next slide after this one. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> there's many uh, famous ekphrastic poems. Uh, this slide has just got a, a very few examples. Rainer Maria Rilke's Archaic Torso of Apollo, um, a German poet, um, but that poem is available in translation online readily. A uh, really wonderful poem. Anne Sexton's A Starry Night is also an absolutely wonderful poem, I think, uh, relating to a, a Vincent van Gogh work. Marianne Moore's No Swan So Fine, really quite a quirky uh, and interesting poem. John Ashbury's Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror, one of the more recent famous ekphrastic poems where he's kind of examining himself as well as an artwork. And W.H. Auden's and William Carlos Williams, uh, two poems that refer to this painting by Bruegel on the, that was on the left of the other side. And here are these two paintings. Um, and I think we'll just read these two paintings so we can just, just get a sense of them. What do you think, Cassandra? Yes, I think they're poems, not paintings, though. Oh, yeah, sorry, we'll just read this. <laughs> My apologies. So the Bruegel painting that we saw uh, earlier, uh, both of these uh, poems are responding to, to that painting, which is a very famous work. Musée des Beaux-Arts by W.H. Auden. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. How, when the aged irreverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him, it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. And just briefly, you know, I'll say that it's really interesting how uh, in this poem, Auden frames in the first stanza of the poem the specifically ekphrastic moment when he introduces 
Bruegel's Icarus in the second stanza. And the second stanza is reasonably faithful to what you see in the painting, but it's informed by the uh, reflective uh, discussion about, you know, old master paintings. That is a painting, Western painting tradition that goes back for many centuries. And, you know, he's already introduced, uh, by the time you get to the painting, ideas around the biblical story that many of those paintings are about, ideas of martyrdom, you know, the death of saints. And, you know, he's contrasted that with the ongoing quotidian daily realities that we all experience all of the time. And so you get this wonderful balancing of gravitas and significance and and the painted tradition with the ordinary daily life of, of everyone. And I think that's quite a, a, a magnificent achieve, achievement in this particular poem. Shall I read the next one? Yeah, definitely. I love the fall, it's so good this one. All right, this is Landscape with the Fall of Icarus by William, William Carlos Williams. And I'm going to, um, um, pronounce his name to give it a slant rhyme. According to Bruegel, when Icarus fell, it was spring. A farmer was plowing his field. The whole pageantry of the year was awake, tingling near. The edge of the sea, concerned with itself, sweating in the sun that melted the wing's wax. Unsignificantly, off the coast, there was a splash quite unnoticed. This was Icarus drowning. So um, you can see, you know, if you didn't know this was about a painting, you wouldn't know it was about a painting. Um, this is um, not intended to be a description. This is not intended to be a summary. This is a new work based, inspired by a painting. Um, and that's what we're going to do today. And, and so I wanted to, yes, yeah, oh, sorry, PH. No, I was just gonna say, and it's also fascinating the way in that poem by William Carlos Williams, you see Icarus introduced at the beginning and mentioned at the end, and he kind of falls through that thin, uh, those thin lines of the poem from top to bottom. So it's, it's a fascinating uh, work. It is. Who doesn't love William Carlos Williams? Come on. I have plums in the ice box. We all do. Um, do. I wanted to choose something really contemporary online and there's lots of ekphrastic kind of competitions where people will put up a prompt and many people respond and I always think they're really interesting to see how different and, and wildly interesting it is to get inside other people's poems and see what they were thinking when they were interpreting artworks and so I, I have one from 2018 I found because I was trying to keep the kind of Louisiana theme going and this one um, is called Louisiana Zombie Afternoon, which appealed to me on some level. Um, and the poem by Kyle Laws is a reflection of um, the painting, which I think is a screen um, print of Louisiana Zombie Afternoon by Jen Z. And um, I will read it really quickly, but you can see that a lot of people were looking at this image as a kind of death of innocence or something about children or, or loss. And so this is how Kyle Laws sort of interprets it. So, interprets it as well. Louisiana zombie afternoon. You know how she feels as you walk down Royal Street in New Orleans on a July afternoon when the sky is so full that it has no chance but to rain. You breathe a sigh of relief after a late breakfast of artichoke and sherry omelettes at Tally Ho before they close for the day. Your lover of 25 asks, do you regret not having a child? I could think about it. You are 50 years old. You've had both tubes tied and one ovary removed when a cyst burst strangled your fallopian tube. He knows this like how lovely the room at the Monteleone is this year. You think he's covering his bets like your great uncle who came down to Mardi Gras for the big card games, put his stake in a certificate of deposit each year that matured in February. Your lover offered. He's safe and like the other times when you're glad you don't carry a handgun, you stare into the blazing sun and blow on the smoke you see in the air that heat rises from crypts and mausoleums where you leave coins and trinkets for the never born. So that's just something a bit quirky and contemporary. Sorry, PH, were you going to say something? Yeah, just saying it's a lovely poem. It moves beautifully from beginning to end. I, I love the way it flows. I, I just love the way he put something confessional out of, out of that print. 
Um, yeah. You know, the, the, I don't know where Kyle, Kyle Laws is from, but the print is from someone in the UK. And we can see that the uh, poet um, assumed that um, all of Louisiana was encapsulated into the French <laughs> Quarter, which, you know, is the standard um, tourist logic. Um, but um, besides that, um, you know, the um, getting, getting something uh, so personal and so intimate um, out of the painting um, is just a, a really, um, I find it a very appropriate reaction. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. Yeah, so um, tips and tricks. So there are many things you can say about a crisis or a crisis. Um, and um, we've just got three uh, points here that may be worth thinking about. And the first one is, and Cassandra's mentioned this already, reimagine the artwork. You know, you really want to have a look at, look at the work and then reimagine it in your poem. And as you're doing that, you've got the opportunity to work laterally in order to develop a relationship between the original artwork and the ecrastic poem so that you've got, you know, two things that are working together, hopefully in a complementary or you know, contradictory or contrasting way, but you've got that relationship and, and you know what you're, you're trying to do in developing the relationship. And in the process of that, you've got the opportunity to create what you can imagine kind of as a third work, something that kind of sits between the painting or the artwork or whatever it may be and the poem. And that's a fusion between the original work and the ekphrastic uh, poem. So think of that as the ekphrastic act as kind of, in many times it's creating a kind of fusion and that's a very exciting uh, moment, I think. So let's check out the prompts. Okay, so we tried to go with things from New Orleans with help from the amazing Jonathan. And um, because we wanted to stay away from more traditional paintings, we do have a painting at the end, but it's abstract. And for those of you who are interested, you can buy it on eBay because I thought it would be exciting to just have that aspect there as well. Um, and so we're just gonna run through them. I'm gonna put the URLs in the chat because if you wanna write about one of them, you probably wanna have a closer look at it. Jonathan, maybe we can also scroll through them in the time people are writing in case they don't have access to something. Sounds good that they can view it on more readily. So we could maybe just tab through those. So um, I think uh, PH and, and Jonathan with his um, local knowledge are just gonna quickly go through the choices for writing about um, artwork today. Yeah, well, look, this is, this is a wonderful work. It kind of perhaps makes some references to those medieval paintings that you see on screens that were in churches and so on. And I, I love the textual nature of this. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of way it invokes aging, not, you know, both for the quality of the material, uh, as well as a kind of rather abstract image making. So it's really, a, a really lovely evocative work. Uh, I'll just say something about this one as well. Rene Magritte, you know, very famous Belgian artist, uh, painter and sculptor, sculptor, and did a whole lot of stuff. And what's quirky about this is taking the idea of a mythological subject and uh, seeing the kind of uh, result of a tree being cut down, but the root of the tree is actually growing over the axe. So it's kind of playing with the idea, well, who did cut this tree down and how does it relate to the axe? So it's playing around with notions of meaning and representation, something that a lot of ekphrastic poems do in one way or another. And Jonathan, you should say something because you work ekphrastically with sculpture in whereabouts, the New Orleans Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is in the New Orleans Sculpture Garden. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah a, a lovely place behind the New Orleans Museum of Art. Um, and yeah, I've been going through and trying, I've been trying to write one good acrostic piece um, based on each of the sculptures in this garden. Um, it's, that's a fun challenge for me because I like some of these sculptures much better than others. Um, Paul has picked good ones here. Um, and, you know, um, well, there's no accounting for taste and all that. Um, some of them are coming out all right. Some of them not so much. Let's see what's next. Yeah, well, this is, uh, this is just a, a choice that, because it's such a fascinating image, um, and Camille Lenane has got some lovely uh, uh, chemistry happening in terms of the, the juxtaposition of various visual imagery in this work. It's quite uh, tantalizing and interesting. And uh, I can already imagine a poem to write, you know, the, the, the head, as it were, floating at the top of the bath, fascinating. And this one, um, you know, uh, when you can make 
wonderful use of color and of tonality in any kind of artwork or, or in, in poems for that matter. You know, you, you can create great effects. And this is wonderful, I think, the way that Louis Maestros has got the purple and the black to almost sort of merge, semi-merge, and that they create a kind of almost shimmering uh, quality to the work and also the starkness of the image making. It's really suggestive. And I find this, this image very beautiful. Yeah, a film still. I mean, Cassandra said earlier about um, how we can uh, re respond ecrastically to any art form and films obviously are, are a really strong contemporary medium. Uh, this You can find this um, film online probably. I'm not going to talk about it, but the image itself is so evocative and beautiful. The shape of the mirror with its kind of slightly ornate uh, embellishments. Uh, and just the image of someone that you see in the mirror, but you're looking at their back as well in a kind of slightly oldie worldy setting. Uh, it's evocative of so much that connects to memory and the past and, and our sense of who we might be. So um, I think wonderful image. It is shabby chic. We all remember shabby chic. Absolutely. This one, I mean, I, I think it's quite a challenge to write acrostic uh, poems about abstract works, but it can be really exciting. In um, my own work, I wrote a poem that I was wanting to write for a long time about my father who died a few years ago. And I didn't manage to write it until I was in a gallery in Japan a few years ago and saw a very abstract work, really just a blue square um, on a gallery wall. And that blue square, very abstract, allowed me to talk about my father and the quality of seeing and and thinking and speaking that I sort of associated with him. And a work like this can perhaps lead some of you into those sorts, that sort of territory. Have you seen that one in real life, Jonathan? Oh yeah, and it's probably obvious from looking at it, but natural light plays a huge role in how this thing presents itself at any given time. You can tell that they've got the, um, um, the uh, um, uh, tiles, um, I forget, yeah. they're stone, um, you know, um, separated from the, from the work so that you can see the shadows as they as the day goes by um they they don't let us in after 6 p.m unfortunately so you know i've never seen it at night but that's wonderful too um but yeah it's um it's a it's a dynamic work yeah i love that work i think it's beautiful i want to see it in real life with gumbo yeah, absolutely. I'd love to see it under a full moon. And yeah, this one is, is an abstract painting. Cassandra, is this one available online? I see it. I've just put up the eBay link for people. Oh, yeah. Well, look, I mean, you know, quite seriously, if, if you find a work like this online, if it's available for sale and you can afford it and you want to, and, and it inspires you to write something ecrastically, you've got the opportunity to, to write a poem buy the work, perhaps um, frame them together in your house or somewhere or, or give them to a friend. Um, you know, I think a work like this is really fascinating. I really love it. I love the colors, the interplay of forms and shapes. It's very suggestive of, for example, to me immediately of perhaps a, a forest or some scene like that. But to, to you, it may be suggestive of other things. That's a great beauty of abstract works. They can lead you in all different directions. So this is a, a lovely image. Thanks for finding it, Cassandra. That's right. I was looking for New Orleans painters. I don't know if anyone knows Esla, but um, but I like Esla's work. Um, so they're the ones we have, and I've put up in the chat the links because um, you probably want to choose one and have a think about it. Jonathan's got an incredibly special moment, which I think eclipses kind of everything with its uniqueness and it's kind of forging into the future with Ekphrasis. And so he's going to introduce that. Do you have a link for that as well? I can put it, or you can put it in the chat. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, what we've got here, uh, Rodney Brown um, is a poet and a dance choreographer. And what he's done here is created a choreography based on his own writing. So I thought it would be interesting if anybody cares to, to take up the challenge of creating a piece of expresses based on a dance based on his own writing, um, their own writing, excuse me. Uh, and I think to get the audio, I need to stop the share and restart it. So we're going to do that. But yeah, you can find a great deal of Rodney's work. Just put this in the chat. Yeah, there's a great deal there, including this video and some others. All right, share screen again and share sound and optimize for video clip. Let's see what happens. Into manipulation. 
intermarriage, interfleeing, interfeeling of wearing right shoes on the wrong feet, interself doubt, inter signs held together, interplastic signs held together, standing up with glue, metal shells, inter queer understanding, queer understanding inter, interplastic lids, inter bosses that correspond, inter inter, inter inter, inter inter, inter knowledge, interprofessional. Intercolored greens, intertofer, inter a cover, inter people, grave marker inter, into the present time, let time of months go by, inter dirt, inter flooring, inter grave marker, grave marker right P R I C E S on the side, into the smell of popping corn, cover of a chair inter. Into large bags of animal food, into paper, into bugs, into more shelving, into advertisements, into more stock, into names, into police, into guns, into the color white, into sunlight, into the color red, into glass doors, into merchandise themes, walls into, into place, into history. Grave marker right, U N B E A T A B L E on a gravestone. Under the side of right, G E N D E R. Across that placard, with a toilet seat down, right on it, B O Y S A. Into the sound of footsteps, into background noises, into people in great financial need. Did that work? Okay, so I thought that might be a fun challenge if anyone wants to take it on. Definitely. All right, are we ready to write now or? I think we are. Okay, we were gonna take about 12 minutes if uh, hopefully everybody will produce something. Um, so yeah, hope to hear from you soon. If you have any questions, do feel free to fire them off while we work. Yeah, and if anyone needs any one of the artworks up on this screen, because they don't have a computer or something that can do both Zoom and that, just let us know and we can put it up.
I think that was 12. I think so. Okay, Does anyone need extra time? Wave your hands around if you need like another minute. Okay, one minute, one minute. <laughs> they don't have to be perfect. They're just like 12 minute drafts, even a couple of lines that you think might open or something from the middle, anything would be good. All right, are we ready, Jonathan? Paul? Yeah, I think that's... Yep, absolutely. I love that. I, I actually read a short press poem. That was wonderful. You just show off. Just stop it. <laughs> Do you want to start first, then? You can read yours. No, 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 no this isn't for me, but I'm just saying I, I just love loved this sort of expressive discussion. But look, um, we've got a, a system going here where people who want to read put up um, their mm -hmm. hand um, by the reactions on down the bottom on your bottom menu of Zoom or whatever it is we're using. So let's go, Jonathan, over to you. Uh, yeah, Lydia Lydia got in the chat and asked to read, so I've unmuted Lydia. Um, hi, um, can you hear the aud my audio? Absolutely. We can hear you fine, we can't awesome. see you. Um, I looked at um, the conceptions of aging. The way she pulled my skin back the first time, stretch latex to reverse aging, she said, I'll make a shrine of your body, demarcate a space in which we can be. In gouache, her medium, she likes to make opaque knowledges smelt me like iron, a higher melting point than the brass handle. I take hold of her. Pockmarked, stretched like a death mask, we found each other too late. We did not grow old together, but with our husbands, somewhat rotten on the inside already, robbed of the potential to become dead wood and cracked paint, rather than forgotten moments of ghosted skin cells and white lace. The way she pulled my skin back the first time, I knew I was already too far gone. Wow. I, mean, I love that. Yay! I just, I <laughs> Thanks. I just think that's an amazing, uh, amazingly polished work for something written in 12 minutes. And, you know, that what, that's a lovely sort of ecrastic work because it takes that, you know, the kind of texture and the sort of um, qualities, many of the qualities of the original um, work and transforms them metaphorically, makes them work figuratively for the poem. And, you know, that way you then extend that sort of metaphorical gesture is really quite beautiful. So I'm, I'm absolutely bowled over by that. I like the peeling and the stretching and the kind of skin-like stuff in there. That's my favourite bit. Absolutely. It's wonderful. I mean, that's really, really impressive. Um, Jonathan, if someone's asked if maybe when people announce which one they're doing, we could put it up on the um, share screen so they can see it while they hear it. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not sure we should have the, the whole room able to share screen. At, at, no, 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 at no, no, I meant, no. I meant the image on our PowerPoint that it refers to. Oh, okay. All right. I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll let everyone share you. their screen. Um, <laughs> anyway, that was Joanne. So maybe Sorry, we just click that first one up again as a reminder after that wonderful poem. Yeah, Hello. I have it right here. Hello. Hello. There it is. Yep. Fantastic. I picked the abstract near the very end, the one that you talked about, Paul. Uh, I don't remember the name of that particular piece. Was the abstract with all the colors? Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the pinkish, yeah, the pinkish. That that, one. That's it, that's it. Yep. Thanks, Jonathan. That's the one. Okay, here I go. Her eye, it saw me. 
gaping at her, wondering why she was blocked, bricked actually, no words to be heard, color abounds to sensitize her company. Shapes nondescript, looking to be named, but still no words, no lips, no mouth. But, but I ask, why bricks? They are sharp, they are blood red, they are rough. Those bricks cannot, do not compliment her eye. So clear, so inquisitive, so knowing, so alive. And through that scope, she says everything. She says nothing. She just waits to be dismantled. Wow, I love that. I love the mouth and the brick. I'm kind of, because I'm a prose poetry nut, I'm kind of thinking that would be great whacked into a prose poem because then you've got the like brick of the prose poem and the, the way that it looks on the kind of white page like it's hanging on a wall as well. Um, but I love the kind of post-feminist sentiment in that too of being dismantled, of finding a voice through brick, all those kinds of themes were so penetrable. Well, yeah, I, really I, great saw, I saw no, that penetrating eye and yeah. I have never written it. I have never done any poetry or anything comparable wow. to this. So that was a first for me. That's amazing. Well, it's wonderful also. It's an example of what we were talking about earlier, that you can work really quite laterally with an abstract image and, and great, create that sort of fusion between the work and the image. And I mean, the two of them work so beautifully together in that complementary way. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, should we hear from Holly? Holly! Holly's like a queen of a process. So like... <laughs> I loved seeing all the pictures. Um, I chose, I mean, and the, the artworks, the Conceptions of Aging also by Ana Menendez. The screen Ana is trifold, in the middle a drawer pull, surely to throw me off as though tempted to peek, seeking tiny pills and pastilles, I'd slide it open, but no, Ana, the trifold reveals itself left to right, first crazed like a winter window pane, iced inside and out, like the delta should it ever dry out, like the skin on the back of my hands, and then central on the egg carton cups for eggs, the cardboard nests like breasts, pastel peach, mocha, cocoa made with too much milk. On it, it is central and provokes aureoles pressed against a window protrudent, aggressive, taunting the circles to the right in the last section, parasol seen from the air, fair game for whatever falls from the sky, whatever fallout befalls the hapless holders of umbrellas. All of us, Anna, even you, even me, aging, cracked, crazed, aching, flattened, ready, full open, opening now, then gone. Ya todo está ido, ido which is Spanish for now it's all gone, gone. I mean, wow. How do you even start coming on that? Okay, parasol seen from the air, love, 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 because you can see the texture. That's how I see it interacting in this kind of way that's so kind of ephemeral, but you can see it there as well. Um, eggs and breasts, hello, that's amazing. And my favorite line is the Delta line. Can you read that again? Oh, should the Delta ever dry out? Yeah, because it's got that, it just reminds me of the texture across that triptych in all different ways. It's quite arid and dry and sort of sandy and odd. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it is wonder, really wonderful, Holly, how you uh, responded to the kind of kind of almost textural, visceral stuff yeah, that's going on. Texture. I think with the, with, the, with the triptych, yeah, and not only connected it to skin, but to a whole range of other tactile kind of imagery. I mean, that's... That's really quite beautiful. I love, I really love the way you've done that. And, and women, I love the women and the breasts and the cartons and yeah. Yeah, so really, really lovely, lovely. Thanks, thank you. All right, are we ready to hear from Cole? Wow, another fabulous, like well-known person right. in the field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely, why not? Yay. Um, what fun. This is just what a great thing to be able to do together. It's really, really nice. Thank you so much, all three of you, for coming up with this. Um, and I love the um, Larry Bell, the 
and uh, so that was that is just such a gorgeous piece. Um, Which one? The Larry Bell. It was Bill, I'm in the box. Oh, okay. I, I'm probably remembering the, 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 exactly. There you yeah. go. Great, thanks. Um, so rough draft, but you know that's, that's what we're all doing, right? Um, yeah. Red gives into red, and through again the fragile thread that runs between the sculptor and the way the sun shone through his hand, the way a flashlight will when pressed against the palm, the thread then setting off again to reach the photographer who framed this photo in the precise light of the odd warmth of just that shade through which the world trades on rose. I've always struck by um, much sculptural photography or land art photography, that it's the photograph that is mm -hmm. also a, a huge part of the art and how often the photographer is not acknowledged. Absolutely. And, you know, and I just thought that photographer chose a great framing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you know, your, your, palm, your palm is, is lovely in a way. It, it, it kind of deals with those various um, ways of perceiving, seeing and various perspectives and invokes that idea of light and, and of a kind of falling perspective. I think that's absolutely magnificent. I, I really love what you've done. And that's, that, you know, taking an abstract image and working so imaginatively with it, I think it's really exciting. I mean, my little work was with a one that followed the abstract painting that Cassandra had found. And I love the freedom that kind of relatively abstract work uh, sort of allows the imagination. And you, that's magnificent. You know what I loved? I loved the breath in it. You just have a beautiful way of reading and the breath was part of the poem. And I was thinking about the sort of texture of the box and the and breath and air on the box and the air between the boxes. And you seem to kind of capture that beautifully in, I mean, I can't see the, you know, the lineation, but it, the way you read it, it just encapsulated the spaces as well as what was there. That's what I really loved about it. I think you just added a whole bunch to it with that, but <laughs> I'll have to think about that too. <laughs> well, I think it's there. The beautifully suggestive work, Cole. I mean, wonderful. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Looks like Bloss raised their hand next. Okay, I picked the uh, um, conceptions of aging. Also, can you see me? Okay, it's kind of dark, but. Yeah, we can see you. Yeah. Okay. So this conceptions of aging. <clears throat> Those three screens are three dreams. Seashells, circus bells, the yellowed veins of a whipple rose screed. I am gilded in squares. I am hardly there. I am everywhere. In panels with no order, no shame, no age, no refrain. You can paint the same sounds behind them, in front, in any order. Time lost in, a, in window frills, the whippoorwill so close to the wall, its cries crack the paint. Mm. Phenomenal last line. Loved it, loved the last line. But I like the way that you wanted to use the triptych and the dreaming part of it, that it kind of had that three element about it all the time. And, and some of the rhyming in there kind of fitted with this idea of the three connected panels. And you know, also that image of cracking you know, cracking the surface or whatever that, that thing was, you know, it's almost as if ecrastic poetry can kind of metaphorically crack, crack the surface or penetrate the surface of artworks and sort of, transform them and there's that relationship happening that can be quite you know violent at times or or transformative so and your your, your work really gets at that sense of ecrasis i really love that aspect of it particularly thank you and the whipper world also is often associated with finality absolutely that was a lovely image yeah okay it looks like lisa's up next I also chose the Larry Bell, which is. The red room is where I see you trying to come clean, but all the edges are sealed. 
you're beautifully transparent and maybe that's enough close to what you always wanted light and clarity tinged with all the spilled blood of your adolescence. I remember listening to your dreams, knowing how much light was never going to be enough. What if translucence now is the height of a soul's metamorphosis into object, tangible like a candy house of spun sugar, licked until the entire story you didn't want dissolved on your tongue? I love that. You know what? I actually saw it through your eyes a little bit as um, like a lozenge, you know, like a lolly, like mm -hmm. an actual yeah, uh, quality. Yeah. And the translucence and the way that, I mean, my favorite line is light was never going to be enough. I love the fact that this particular piece turns on light and Jonathan talked a little bit about how it sort of changes and you've sort of captured that idea of the light being essential to what is seen and what is not seen and the sealed also, element. Yeah, and also that bodily connection with blood and so on is so, so beautifully done. Such a, a simple gesture in the poem and so effective. It's really, I, I found that really quite moving actually. Nice. Well done. A brilliant exercise. Thank you for providing it for us all. It's really, really wonderfully done. Oh, thank you. All right, looks like Kree's up next. Hi. Um, I also very well. Sculpture. Say it again. Uh, I did the Larry Bell sculpture. Okay. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It should be nestled wetly beneath my ribs, pulsing quietly so far below the skin, I can rarely find my own staccato heart beating at wrist or neck. Everything is made for a purpose, but here you sit plucked out and set in place in a land far from your temple, singing yourself to sleep when the gates close at six, wishing your glass house closer. There is nothing to nestle against, no veins using you as a through way to lessen their blueness. Instead, you have re re remade yourself hard gleam from strangers' eyes and given up your cage of bone for a cloudy box. Concrete is all you touch now and rain, the only damp thing that drapes against you. Another beautiful one. I think the placement in yours was something I was drawn to. So the idea of it nestling and it being set in place. So um, I kind of like that idea too, when we see exhibitions or galleries and it was a bit of what Cole was saying to think of it outside of its sort of self, how it was sort of constructed or where it is or what place it's in or how it's, how it's being presented. And I got that mixed with the kind of more, more personal idea of nestling and touching and not touching and those sorts of themes. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and the lovely, the lovely ending. I mean, it's really powerful when you, you contrast the images that have preceded the image of concrete with that, you know, transform moment, moment of transformation. And, and that's beautifully worked up to. I, I think that's very impressive. Thank you. All right, let's hear from Marie. Good evening. Good evening. That's my first time reading. <laughs> All righty, it's good to hear from you. So I chose the Anna Hernandez. I am turning 60 this year and I'm pretty obsessed with aging as you can imagine. <laughs> time has painted me weathered, fragile and frayed, sometimes nearly melting away. I unfold rusting joints and shifting bones, fiercely holding on. Wow, the resoluteness at the end. I love the idea of holding on, like the what it's made of and how it's it's going to keep going, even if it gets a bit weathered. Right. I love it. 
Well, so, you know, that's the, the, the relative brevity of that work is a great example of how when you're, you know, responding ekphrastically, sometimes, you know, if you've got a, a powerful piece and you've just got a relatively brief response, you can really allow the space for the two to kind of have that kind of dialogue because the resonances that come out of that brief utterance, relatively brief utterances, you know, really work powerfully and, and you've achieved that there. It's really, I, I really love that. Response. Thank you. Yeah, killer first reading ever. Are you joking? You're going to do way more of them. <laughs> well, I write a lot, but I don't really like reading. So. <laughs> oh, you have to now because you've done it so well. It's just, it's great. <laughs> okay. Um, Todd. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Jonathan. Oh, my God. These are so awesome. Cole, yeah, I have to say that that hand image, real, the flashlight against the hand really took me. I just flashed back to my childhood and totally remembered that we had had a flashlight that had this um, sort of thick, you know, cone on it. It's like the dog's cone on, it, on its head, this thick red plastic, right? So the light really came through as red. So there was like this red spot on the other side of your hand, which was really cool. So anyway, I totally forgot about that. Um, so I just kind of riffed on um, the Magritte. <clears throat> I called it er. Each word is its own line. Ax, root, let, lex, con, tact, I, turn, on, up, root, ask, Lex, last knock. Tax, Lex, look, two, four, last night. Act, up, ax, down, split, hair. Or, and, not, Lexi's hair, brain, root, bound. Ask, who would, ask, who did, ask, why. Wow, I don't know whether I could come up with that, that many <laughs> monosyllabic words and have such a rhythm and taste to it. Axe up, axe down, split hair. That's my favorite bit. But um, I also noticed there was a Lexi in there, right? So it was the one moment you kind of split from the from the monosyllables. It worked really well. And it kind of had a creepy, you know, I think that sculpture is kind of creepy because the tree is kind of like anthropomorphically like holding the axe. And I reckon that you really kind of captured that that sort of the, in the pace of it, it was kind of menacing in its own way. Yeah, and also lovely. You know, if you look at the two together, you know, lovely to have such a, a playful, if, if rather creepy, weird image um, with such a playful use of language and something that really foregrounds that sort of um, the, the idea of making and of thinking about how we're constructing meaning, which both works do separately but you know combined that'd be a that's a lovely combination so really lovely interesting response awesome thanks so much it was fun to do would anyone else like to read ah uh, Catherine's waving her hand Catherine ross Uh, hello, I also chose the artwork by um, Anna Hernandez, Conceptions of Aging. More than framed fragments, more than mud flat and rusted plate, because armour ages. Touch me, I am ant nest, volcanic, weathered into more than the sum ornate a hint at past glamour. This splintered screen is only our division beneath the rot, between the grains. I am interesting. Wonderful. Wonderful. I was gonna say the volcanic and the rock for me is so interesting. I always connect volcanoes with Emily Dickinson. So I kind of like the feminist kind of element in that as well. 
Yeah, and a lovely, lovely sense of moving from that image into a consideration of sort of intimacy and 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 matters that are around sort of a personal subjectivity and experience. I mean, that transition you made is you, you did so effortless, effortlessly, and really helps reinflect the seeing of the work itself. So, as an acrostic gesture, I think it's incredibly successful. Well, Paul, would you like to talk about national expresses? Should we turn to the, um, we have, oh, we have, uh, we're, yeah. yeah, let's see here. Let's go back to the PowerPoint and there we go. Yeah, look, just um, as a way of starting, I just want to thank everyone for their readings and to say how wonderful they are. And I'm actually astonished at the, the amazing work that people have done in what was 12 minutes or 13 minutes and how incredibly impressive they are. I mean, first drafts that in some cases are, 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 feel like, you know, on first reading anyway, like they're nearly finished and are really exciting respon responses. You know, when you hear three or four different responses to the same work and they're so various and, and so impressive, it's really exciting. I, I, I really love that. And just sort of extending that sort of sense of the way a crisis can move into the truly imaginative response. You know, notional ekphrasis is, is such an exciting extension of the ekphrastic moment because you're not only a, a writing an imaginative work, say a poem, but you're um, imagining the work that you're responding to. And there are some really fabulous um, historical examples. One of the first most ancient um, examples of ekphrasis is in Homer's The Iliad, and there's quite a long extended passage on the shield of Achilles. And, you know, Homer is imagining the shield of Achilles. He doesn't have it actually in front of him. And it's a wonderful piece of notional phrases, if you like, the mode of epic poetry. John Keats's Ode on, the Grecian, on a Grecian Urn, marvelous poem. Um, you know, he's, it's about a Grecian urn, but as far as we know, he was imagining that particular Grecian urn. So it's a piece of notional ekphrasis. <coughs> and Robert Browning's My, My Last Duchess is a very, a famous example, although there's now some suggestion that's connected to an actual painting, but he certainly imagined a great deal in his evoc poetic evocation. <coughs> Excuse me for a second. Well, I was going to say, because you love notional ekphrasis because you did all of your time in Rome and we laugh a bit about the fact that Paul always manages to get in his, uh, his Rome residency, which he's done again today. But I did want to add that the first time I read some of your poems, I thought they were based on real artworks and I Googled not only the artwork, but the actual gallery of antique art. I'm like, well, if I get to Rome, where's this gallery of antique art? And I kind of feel like with notional ekphrasis, that's got to be the biggest compliment, right? That you Google it because on some level you believe it's real. Yeah, well, I mean, thanks, Cassandra. I mean, the, the, the book I wrote was really a, a, a way of walking, perambulating through this gallery that I'd imagined and I'd set in Rome and really had, it had bits of real, uh, you know, real galleries that I've been in, been in and occasion and had quite a lot of works of art. So a lot of them I imagined, some of them were actual works that exist in galleries around the world that I've seen. But, you know, in the end, it was a, an exercise in imagining uh, a world I was walking through where I was responding to art and, and, you know, the protagonist was kind of thinking about that connection to modernity themselves, subjectivity. And, you know, the notion of a moment is just a, a great moment where you can uh, use the idea of art to consider modes of representation and perhaps write about things that without that sort of imagined frame of reference, you wouldn't be able to get at in a poem. So, you know, I just strongly encourage any of you interested in ekphrasis to have a think about imagining the work of art and then responding in that poetic mode. Paul, do you care to read that poem? Would you like me to? I can, I would... yeah. So this is just one of the rooms. This is just one of the rooms. It's a short prose poem in uh, the Notional Gallery of Antique Art. Third room. We can choose not to believe it. Pious grace and glory writ large on the walls. We can decide to accept beauty hanging close to where we stand. Exhausted, we're able to step into dirty streets and redolent decay. But near the door, there's a seven-year-old girl dressed formally in green. Her gaze might be modern, 
hope, expectation, puzzlement, the painters caught it well, and a sense of fractiousness, as if she's sick of standing still. What I, um, what I love about that piece is the introduction of the little girl. You're not clear whether she's part of the room or in a painting. You know, it kind of, it kind of um, um, leads you to where, where you're going as opposed to just a description of this imaginary place. And, and like in a crisis, um, there's some really interesting pieces coming out about the gallery experience or about the exhibition space or about mm -hmm. wandering through a particular area that has a lot of artworks um, being exhibited there or, or being public art, those kinds of exciting moments of being there. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the whole um, ekphrastic moment for me is partly about relationships, relationship with image and poetry, with people, poetry, subjectivity, poetry, seeing poetry. So, yeah, I mean, that that's the kind of thing that fascinates me with ekphrasis and which I was trying to get at in works like that. Yeah. So I think we just have places that you can send these amazing works that you uh, that you began today. Is that right, Jonathan? Have we got, I think, a slide with some of the... There we go. Some of the considerations. I put my email address in the chat so you can email me if you'd like me to send you a copy of the um, PowerPoint or if you just want to say hello or anything at all. Um, and I'll put, I'll put it up again. It's a bit further up in the chat. Um, the most obvious one is the ekphrastic review that seems to have like a weekly ekphrastic um, prompt and then a whole lot of people send in their work and they sort of choose the one that they... Um, they want to display and then they have some runners up I think at the bottom so you get to see a little bit like we've done today multiple people's responses to to one ekphrastic prompt which is great there's the ekphrasis magazine I kind of like the title of the light ekphrastic uh, there's two prime ekphrastic poetry competitions um, I think the 2021 one of the first one is is gone so you'd have to think about 2022 but I think the bottom one is still uh, a possibility but there are many many more examples these ones seem to be have some of the best or the better poetry on them so I thought it would be good to share them and get you to do something but there's nothing worse than having this great poem and not quite knowing what to do with it so um, if you want to send it somewhere ekphrastically but the joy of ekphrastic poetry is that you can also send it to any kind of any journal or any kind of um, place that publishes any kind of writing really let me paste those into the chat. Okay. I'll put my email address over there. It disappears. There, so we can just copy and paste. There we go. Yeah, I can see it now, Jonathan. <clears throat> Great. Yeah, if you'd like um, Australian journals, email me. I've got lots of places you can email. We don't have an ekphrastic journal, but we have lots of um, poetry journals in Australia. So yeah, spread your poetry far and wide. Get published down under. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks to those of you who read your work. It was uh, really delightful to hear. Um, thanks to those of you who came in to read your work. That's cool too. Um, yeah, it was great spending this evening with you. And I hope you come to the New Orleans Poetry Fest tomorrow. It's closing night. It'll be one more reading. And um, all of our past events are archived on at nolapoetry.com. Yeah, and I'd like to echo those comments. Thanks so much, everyone. Wonderful to be with you and to write with you and chat. And thanks, Jonathan. Fantastic. Thanks, ah, thank Cassandra. you, Paul. Thanks, Cassandra. Yeah, Jonathan, you're awesome. Ah, thank you. Thank you all. You really created a sense of presence i mean somehow it actually i feel like i've spent an hour and a half with y'all it's been really no, i feel sad that like i'm gonna miss you all <laughs> you took on my little like plastic riding party <laughs> can i mention I something quick to make, make dinner for family so much love to all thanks for coming oh, thank, you. Thank, thank you thank you thank you bye someone asked you to mention something thank you so much oh yeah I wanted to mention, uh, this, isn't, this isn't a propaganda or anything, but um, my book, um, Luna Lunera, it's on, you can see it on uh, a link on my webpage, but the whole book is different. I spent five years choreographing dance for digital poetry. And so these are the print poems that 
came out of the digital poetry, but they're all, so I didn't realize it, but I think they're expressive because wow. they're all like, um, paint, they're all like paintings of digital dance. And then the dancers would read the poems and because they have, they're like the line, words are laid out on the stage, on the page, and they would like make that into the stage. So uh, anyway, that's a, just a point of interest. I didn't realize like maybe the book is like drastic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you mock it that way. <laughs> so wait, did Lost, did the dance, was there a choreography that came first and you wrote? No, it was like collaborative. So like they'd read the poems and then, oh, I had some ideas like, you know, like there's like a cave at, at Lasco. And so there's a, like a fire. So that's kind of round. You know what I mean? And, um, and then there's like some stuff in Andalusia. So that has kind of like uh, different kind of layouts, but then they'd sort of, you know, they'd make transitions and fill in the story really. So it was, it was uh, well, it took those yeah. five years of work. So it was, oh, and they're all on video too. The dances are on video on my webpage too. Oh, cool. What's that? Awesome. I'll have to check it out. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Hi. Hey, good night. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Miss you, Holly. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.